Hello bitches, welcome back to another video where I just basically walk through a speed paint and talk about some hopefully inspirational advice for anyone just going through life or more specifically in the art and animation world. So today I wanted to do a video about the do's and don'ts about landing a job in animation, especially if this is your first time ever applying, but also just know that these are things that even I, as someone who has been working for a few years already, still keep in the back of my mind whenever I'm jumping onto a new project because every project is going to be different and you're going to have to equip yourself with these tools once again whenever you're back in the interviewing process, which can be annoying, but it's something that honestly you just have to bear with in a nomadic industry. So yeah, as for today's comic, it is once again really irrelevant to this topic, but it's just more as a background thing to play as I just casually speak to you all about some tips and tricks I got up my sleeves. So yeah, but if you do want to read the full comic, it is on my Instagram at mutrippled on Instagram. So to start off with the don'ts, because I honestly find it easier to speak about that first, I'm going to talk about things that you shouldn't do, especially when you're in the interviewing process and the recruiter has already, you know, seen your work and you're now in the interviewing stage. Because I feel like the interviewing stage is usually the point where some people either make it or don't make it. So the first don't is don't list your guilty pleasure movies unless you're specifically asked for it when people ask you, what's your favorite film? What's your favorite movie? Because it might seem like a very harmless question when people ask you that in an interview and you might just be like, oh, well, my favorite movie is blah, blah, blah. But it's some film that really is not that well known for its cinematography or any story points, or it's just a film that doesn't really have any recognition in the film world and might even be seen as silly to some. So as sad as it is, I would say don't mention your favorite guilty pleasure movie if you know that it might not have any cinematic recognition because people really might be asking you that question more so to see what is your taste in film and what you might be bringing to the table based on your inspiration. I know that this kind of sucks because I wish we could all be honest and talk about things that we genuinely like, but I feel like this is something that is more saved for a water cooler moment at work when you're just chatting with your coworkers after you've made it past the interview stage, you know? But I find that whenever people ask you these types of questions when you're in the interviewing stage, it is more to get a taste of what your sensibilities are as an artist and to see if it aligns with theirs. And if it doesn't align with theirs, there's a chance you might get not considered for the project. So I think that this is a moment where you just shouldn't risk it. So just mention films that you've seen before and you think the cinematography or the tone or the characters somehow will fit the project you're interviewing for, it doesn't have to be your favorite movie, but unfortunately I just feel like this is just how it works to get through that stage of the interview. And again, I don't think that you have to love every film out there that's an Oscar winning film. I just think if you know of it and you just briefly enjoyed it, I think it's safe to mention. But at the same time, also don't mention films that you've never watched and just throw out a random name that you've seen because people will know if you saw it or not because most people in these interviews have seen a lot of movies and films. So if you mention a film that you've never watched, they might know that you're just saying it just for the sake of saying it instead of actually understanding what the film was about. So if you are going to throw out a handful of films for the sake of proving your taste in films, make sure that it's something you've seen before. Again, as a disclaimer, I'm not a fan of the fact that people do this, but that's just kind of how the system works for now, and that's just how we gotta get by as artists. So anyway, next. The next don't is don't show a portfolio that is not intended for that type of project. So I know that whenever people make their portfolios, whether it be storyboard, character design, you might show a range of your work, which usually to me is the safest bet because if you show a range of different genres that you're capable of telling stories or drawing characters in, people could usually be like, oh, well, I've seen them at least have this 
range so they could be able to do a sci-fi fantasy project because I saw something like that in their portfolio, which is great. But there are some people who do very specific niche portfolios, like they only do, for example, alien portfolios, or they only do furry portfolios, or they only do slice of life normal people portfolios. I don't know. It's one of those things where people will look at your work and just envision, can I see Michelle working on my project? They look at your work and if the project you're applying for is a sci-fi action show and the work that you're showing is very cute wholesome little animals or something and it is not at all relatable to the show they might not consider you so if you get an idea on the job listing that you're looking at for example sometimes they will already say we're looking for an action board artist make sure that the storyboards or the character designs in your boards could potentially fit an action project vibe but if it's something that totally might not fit an action project i would say try to not send it because it will just probably get ignored the third don't especially if you've worked in various animation jobs already, but also this is still applicable to entry level people. Don't lowball yourself for the first offer. If someone just throws a rate at you or a price to pay you weekly immediately from the get go, just don't take that first one and at, and at least try to negotiate once to see what happens and work from there. Because if you at least negotiate, the, the answer they might give back to you is a compromised answer or it's a no and it will be easier to make a decision based on that. But I feel like one of my biggest regrets in some of the jobs I've taken was not really negotiating for a higher rate. Especially now knowing that a lot of artists are exposing how much they get paid nowadays online anonymously, there is definitely room for more pay for artists, but I feel like it might come from artists either not speaking up enough or fearing that if they list a higher rate that they want, they could just easily get rejected. But usually it's not like that. Like obviously you want to be somewhat reasonable and know what other artists are making and not just be like, I want to make a million dollars a week as lovely as that would be but I think if you ask for a reasonable higher amount it actually is worth consideration but you don't know until you ask so a rule I generally make for myself is to always make sure I negotiate at least once and see what happens from there to work from that point onward with my rate otherwise you'll just go on with your job just never knowing what could have been if you just asked so the next don't is don't talk about irrelevant experiences too much unless if it's your first entry level job in which you might have to talk about something that is not animation related. For my first internship ever, I talked about my fashion internships in the fashion industry, which were very irrelevant, but it was the only source of experience I had to bring up, which makes sense. So in that case, I think it's fine to talk about how you were able to contribute to a team or how what you did at this other company might be useful for this animation studio. But if you are someone who has already had animation experience or you're someone who's already like job hunting again for another job, try to talk about experiences that are more relevant to the job that you are going for because I think a lot of people tend to go for this generalized like, oh yeah, I want to basically go to a place and offer something new to the table, to the studio, and I'm searching for growth opportunities, which are all very vague, but great statements. But people generally want to know what it is you're going to bring to this specific job. I think specificity is the key. And if you're going for, again, a fantasy sci-fi project, talk about relevant experiences you've had that could be useful for a sci-fi fantasy project or whatever. And if you're going for a storyboard role, talk about how your experiences from your previous storyboard jobs or comic jobs or any type of sequential art jobs are going to be relevant to this. Don't talk about the time that you were doing character designs on this other project for a storyboard role. Like, yes, of course you can brief mention it but I don't think you should go too deep into it and get to the point where people might actually believe you were more meant to be a character designer or something instead of a storyboard artist so try to keep your discussion as closely as possible to the job position that you are applying for 
And the last don't I have is kind of similar to what I mentioned in many of the points earlier, but don't be dishonest at the same time and make things up just to fit into the role because people will eventually find out and sometimes you also have to be honest with yourself too. So if you are mostly a drama, action, cinematic person, but there are no jobs out there other than a comedy role for primetime adult TV or something, like, yes, I do think that artists should do whatever it takes to survive because I feel like we shouldn't just rely on projects that are similar to our tastes in order to get by. Like, sometimes you will have to take a job that is outside of your comfort zone in order to make ends meet, unfortunately. But at the same time, don't be overly dishonest with, you know, what your capabilities are because that could lead you to having a chance of getting fired. And then if you get fired, People might talk about you to other studios and that's not something that you really want to put yourself through because it might damage you more in the long run and I just think that's just the case of being in a very small niche industry. That's why I think in general you have to find the perfect balance of talking about your experiences and even if they might not be exactly the same as the job you're going for, talk about your past experiences in ways that they will align or match up to the current project you're applying for. So moving on to the do's of whenever you're in the interview stage or applying for a job in animation. The first do is when you're speaking about other projects and your past experiences, talk about people you worked with who the person you're interviewing with might have known or worked with before, but hopefully in a good way because there are people who know of people in the bad way. But you want to make sure that the person that you've worked with before could be someone that your interviewer or the person who is asking you questions might have worked with positively in the past because as, I don't know, shallow as it sounds, animation is a very connection-based industry and usually when people get an idea of who you worked with before, they kind of get, you know, a sense of what projects you've worked with, what tone of projects you've worked with before, and just how you might have worked under these specific directors or showrunners. So there was a good portion of my projects where I've worked with a lot of Pixar alum people and they've all left Pixar to go work at these other studios and even though they are at different studios though they still have references of what their time was like working back at that one bigger studio and hopefully if they had a good connection when you mention them in your interview they will be like oh Michelle worked with so-and-so. I know him. He has great sensibilities. I like that guy, which means they might then connect that with you. And I don't really think it's that great to generalize people like that. Again, it's just a part of the system. And while I am listing these things, I don't necessarily agree with all of them. It is just the nature of how things work in this process. So yeah, because animation is such a connection-based industry, I do think that throwing out names or name whatever, name dropping, that's the word, is unfortunately and fortunately going to help you. So if you do know people in the industry, like yeah, drop out their name for a moment, but of course don't obsessively talk about them in your interview. So the next do is to definitely ask questions when you are in the interviewing stage and ask specific clear questions because it shows that whether or not if you're an entry level person or if you've worked on previous shows or films before, it shows that you have knowledge about the animation pipeline and you are already thinking about what to expect and it shows that you are serious. But if you are an entry level person and you don't know what to ask, here are some good starter questions questions for you to ask because I feel like these questions will show that you kind of know what you should be thinking about when you get on an animation project. So the first question is ask about the project pipeline overall, like what tools are they working with? Storyboard Pro, Photoshop, what schedule they're working with, and basically how much time that you're going to be given to work on each assignment that they might hand out to you on the project, and how many artists are assigned to each team, because you want to know, are you going to be working with other board artists or artists or designers, or are you going to be working alone most of the time? 
Then ask about the specific expected timeline of an artist on your team. So this can go back to like, I don't know, asking about the specific timeline of an assignment on your project. Like that could be five weeks for a storyboard artist before you move on to the next assignment. Or ask about the overall timeline of the project itself because let's say you're on one of those streaming service projects which tend to be more on the short term end of things that could be like one to two years you want to know like hey am I going to be expected to look for a new job again in a year and a half I don't know so you want to make sure you know what your longevity on this project is and then ask if they offer growth opportunities but don't ask about it vaguely because I feel like a lot of studios are always trying to appeal to people and be like yeah we offer growth opportunities x studio values diverse voices and we want to bring more you know inclusive voices blah 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 and they'll give you a lot of very nice sounding sentences but that's not always the case and once you're working at the studio it's like a totally different story so you want to make sure you ask what are some actual physical things they're doing at the studio even like not just for yourself but to remember to challenge the studio that you're applying for and ask what physical things they actually do at the studio to offer growth opportunities for artists like some people or some studios have these accelerator programs at their studios where you know they train artists into leadership roles or they have programs where they allow artists to pitch a project that could be viewed by executives or whatever like they have these things that can give artists the chance to grow but not every studio actually has a developed program or system for it so you want to make sure you ask like what is it exactly they're doing so if you do eventually want to direct or if you do eventually want to lead on something there's a chance for you to do that but if they don't then what are you doing you might be wasting your time there if it's not in alignment with your future goals then lastly ask about the style or tone of the show because i feel like some people might go in with a blind eye and have never seen what the project is like before only to find out that it's totally different than what they were expecting. So then they end up doing something that is not in alignment with the show and then there's some tension and conflict there because there will be a lot of adjustment. So it's important to ask about the style and tone of the show. Make sure like you're working with something that the boarding style is something you're familiar with. Is it cinematic? Is it TV? Is it flat? What is it? Because you don't want to have come from a flat sitcom comedy adult TV show only to find out you're being thrown into some very cinematic universe that has camera angles of all the different angles and you're just like oh my god I only know how to work in the X and Y space or something so yeah Okay, so that do was very long, but for the next one, it is to include a resume and cover letter, especially for first time people who are not originally in animation or just got out of school. I think it's important to include a cover letter because for me, I only included a cover letter during after I graduated and applied to jobs, but afterwards I never really submitted a cover letter again. Unless if you're doing it for a studio that might have no idea who you are, then yeah, consider doing a cover letter. But for your resume, it's kind of like any job, just try to keep it clear. Nobody cares if it's pretty just because you're in an art field. Clarity is more key in this and the easier it is for the person to get through your resume to understand what you did, the higher the chances you might have to either moving forward or gaining a clear answer on what they're going to decide to do with your job application. And if you have any irrelevant information on your resume, just get rid of it because a lot of jobs won't like want to look through that or it might get you the chance to be not considered for the job. So you don't want to give people information that could risk your application. So if you have something like about Girl Scouts or something from your middle school or elementary school days, like obviously that's an exaggeration. Just don't include stuff like that on your portfolio. You want to keep things strictly for animation. And if you are someone who has interned already, like I would say you can and get rid of the internships on your resume after you've worked for like maybe more than four years or five years in animation but it's still good to just have on hand in case but if you find that your internships are taking up too much space on your resume then yeah get rid of it 
So then, for your cover letter, you want to make sure that it's not just a generic cover letter about why you're just good at this role and why you will bring something new to the table. Like, I feel like those are the two most basic points everyone will bring on their cover letter. But I think you should definitely try to have your cover letter match as many points possible to the job listing and what it asks for. For example, if the job listing is like, oh, we're looking for an action board artist with at least three years of animation, talk about your experience doing anything that could be close as possible to action boards within your past three years of animation. Like the key is action and three years for this job listing. You want to answer to those points in your cover letter or if you're applying for an entry level job, again, just make the points in your cover letter match specifically to the job listing because whenever you see a job listing, you see all these bullet points of what they're looking for. Try to match like at least a good majority of them if you can because people are looking Looking to fill in a very specific role and you know anyone out there can say something like I'm looking to grow and gonna offer something new to the table so yeah being specific is key once again so then the last two do's I will mention quickly because this video is starting to get really long is to definitely show up at public events that welcome anyone to an animation related event because there are going to be conventions like Lightbox Expo, CTN, online classes like CDA and Brainstorm. So these are opportunities where you can definitely be meeting def different people from the industry. And while that is great, I will recommend don't ask people to look at your portfolio or give you a portfolio review because some studios have this rule where they're not allowed to give portfolio reviews to students and stuff like that. And I think it can sometimes be a little bit disrespectful, especially if the artist never claimed that they will be doing portfolio reviews because it could eat up a lot of their time and they're giving a lot of free knowledge for free when they might be there more so to either showcase their art and do more simple meet and greets. So try to avoid showing your portfolio to people who never asked for it unless if there is a very specific portfolio review session at the convention that is intended for that. So yeah, I personally find that the people who are most memorable at these convention things were people who just kept interactions with me respectable, they just gave me a basic introduction and then maybe one day they'll share their art on social media and I'll eventually stumble across it on my own accord and be like, oh hey yeah, I know that person. But I don't have like a memory of like anyone asking me to do anything for them, which you know, makes it a little bit more amicable for me. And then lastly, lastly, the last do is to talk about side projects you do and how they might tie into your role as a positive influence because people tend to be afraid to talk about the things they do outside of work because they don't want to give people at work the impression that they're not paying attention or they might not be working on what they're supposed to be doing at work. But I think in animation, it's kind of like everyone gets it, like everyone understands we're all just in this project-based industry together and it totally makes sense if you have to do something else to supply a supplemental form of income or you have to pursue this other project to gain some sort of leadership credibility whatsoever so I think it's okay to mention these things especially to your peers or colleagues and even your directors at times but of course like I wouldn't share these things to maybe the executive of the studio or something like that because I don't know what position I would ever be in to really like talk about that with them unless if I'm pitching a project to them. So I think for the most part it's okay to talk about your other side projects. For example, if you're doing a book or you have social media, that's just your way of finding your voice and having a voice for board artists, character designers, or any artist in general is very valuable so people know that you have your own vision, you have your own opinions, you have your own thing that you're going to probably offer to the table that this studio does not currently have. And I think that nowadays a voice is very valuable in the animation industry, especially when everyone claims to be seeking diverse voices. So here's their chance to make that happen, you know? So don't be afraid to talk about 
things that you do on the side that could actually be beneficial for your main job. So yeah, I think that those are some pretty good don'ts and do's or in the proper way do's and don'ts of getting a job in animation or what to do when you're in that application phase. So yeah, this video is probably one of the longest ones I've done in a while. So I hope that this supplied you guys with some good advice on just what to avoid doing and what you could be doing. You know, this is not like a strict guideline or rule. It is just stuff based on my experience that I have noticed in the past recent years and just the current state of animation. So yeah. Anyway, thank you for watching this video. I hope that this was helpful and I will see you all in the next one. So peace out and stay wholesome, bitches.